And Hello, good morning, that. everyone. Welcome to Cloud Chats episode 13, JavaScript tools, two-factor authentication, and a Python calculator here on May 13th, 2021. My name is Mason Egger, and these are my co-hosts. Can I do it right this time? Chris and Matt. I did I, it. So, I so, did it. No, yep. I, I did it. I got it, Matt. It's so hard. The mirror. Uh, oh, it was good. But I, I got to see it. what you're doing. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. It's hard. I don't know we'll why. I, one day. You know, you know, I won't. I won't because I do it once a week. Yeah. See? Yeah. It's not easy. Like, because every it's time it easy. moves us around, you know, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to single gesture. Yeah. That way, it, that way it's always the same. But that's easy. Uh, uh, so good morning, everyone. And today, for our cold open, we're talking about home offices, monitors, keyboards, ergonomics, everything you have that makes your home office or your home desktop work for you. So, Chris, what do you have? Because I know you have a lot. So, I want to hear all the cool stuff. I have a lot. I wonder if I can call in with my phone and, like, run around. <laughs> um, kind of messing here. But um, I guess my main setup is... An M1 Mac Mini. Actually, come back to me. I'm going to try to call in. Okay. okay. This is going to go so wrong, but okay. Uh, I guess I can I can go through mine quickly. Um, it's much simpler, I think. Uh, 2019 Intel MacBook Pro uh, connected to an eGPU with an RX 580 inside, I think, um, that powers three 1080p screens, one of which is vertical. Uh, oh, that vertical and, screen. That vertical, vertical screen, screen. It has Slack on it and nothing but Slack on it. Okay, that's that's different. I, most people use their vertical screen for code, but you have so many Slack messages, you need a vertical 1080p monitor for it. I have an entire monitor dedicated to Slack. Uh, my MacBook screen is dedicated to email, and I have two screens in front of me that are for like general purpose, which is mostly code. Isn't that four screens? Yes, yeah, so four screens total. Oh, my three goodness. External. That's just That's my lunch. Uh, it's, no. it, well, no, it saves you context switching, right? Like it's far easier just to look to a different screen than it is to change window. It is. It is. I definitely used to use uh I yeah, I, I used to have a lot of screens. I've I've trimmed them down over the years. So yeah, I don't know. I can't like go to a single screen setup really. Like if, if I'm trying to do anything. I don't know, multitasky. Mm -hmm. I agree that contact that not context switching of just keeping one thing or two things on one screen is just like gold. Yeah, I, I, get, I definitely got into like two screens, but just a single screen I could never deal with again. Definitely two screens, I think is the minimum for me. I have three. So I have two 27 inch monitors and one little 23 inch. Mm -hmm. Um, the 23 inch is pretty much like my perpetual Slack screen, but I do minimize it and use it like it for like Spotify or like anything that I like. That's the, I don't really work on that screen unless I have to. My main screens are my 27. It's usually what I'm working on and then a browser for reference material. And that's, yeah. that's, that's what I can do. And I could do without the Slack screen. Honestly, I'd probably get more work done if I wasn't constantly looking at Slack. Let's be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I, yep. So, I feel that one. <laughs> Yeah, so I used to do it where I used to have like my laptop hooked up, but I actually I, I'm using my desktop here with like I built in like 2016, so it's got like a 2070, it's got like an i uh, i an i i 7700 k mm -hmm. in it. Um, it's been getting slower and slower for the past couple of months. Like it's starting to choke, and I'm wondering if we are uh, if we're nearing the end because it's it's about five years old now. I don't think um, you are. Just just go through what's running. Do a proper even if like even if you really want to fresh install the Windows that will solve so many issues. That, yeah, after you know, I don't know if I'd ever get things back the way I need them to work though. That's what I'm yeah, afraid so of. That's that's the fear I have as well. Like a fresh install of Mac OS would do my MacBook a world of good right now, but yeah, I don't know if I could recover. Oh my goodness! So and then uh, on top of that, I've got a normal mouse key, and then my DOS keyboard. I'm proudest of my DOS keyboard, Model S Professional, blank keycaps. Uh, clicky MX Blues, metal backplate, so like whenever I type, you can hear it. Like I've always mm -hmm. said that if my neighbors can't hear me typing, am I really typing? Yeah, no. Stop. I have a 
it's my keyboard. I have like a an old Apple one. Um, not the old Apple mechanical ones. Like the the chiclet. Yeah, I think. You know the you know the magic keyboards that they have like previous generation. Yeah, I think uh, I think you need to turn on your camera and show us. I don't actually have a camera here to show you. <laughs> so I was trying to sneak it in. Um, okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not a keyboard person. Um, I should be, but I'm not. I wasn't until I got this one, and I'm. I I only like this keyboard person. Like I, someone recommended it to me. I used it. It's been amazing. Like I definitely felt my productivity go up when I switched from because I was using old Dell, like Dell keyboards. Like I used to go to the discount store and buy like the ones that come with your computer. Like I just went through one of those until I broke it, and now I've had these for. I've been using these keyboards for probably five years now, and I, I love them. They're they're great. So, mm -hmm. and I have no desire to look anywhere else. I think the metal back plate makes a big difference because every other keyboard always feels cheap because it's plastic. But this one's like like this one weighs like about 10, 11 pounds. It's like, like you could you could use it as a baseball bat if I really wanted to. Yeah, yeah. But DOS is cool. Uh, I've had three over the years. I think the DOS is like the the gateway into the mechanical keyboard world mm -hmm. um and the the dos 5 is programmable as well so you could have like each key light up based on if you have a new slack message or a new email um every now and then i look at those and i i tell myself no and i stop before i spend a lot of money on something i really don't need but looks really cool yeah i got the five i got the five and and it's okay it's not that great Okay, Chris, I think you managed to dial in. You going to give us a I tour? I did dial in. Yeah. So, we have Chris Bot on on camera. Hmm? Oh, we need to add it. We need to add it to or you, yeah. you got okay, it. So okay, this is Chris Bot. Hello. Um I guess I could remove my other self. No, we still need your audio. Uh we can add audio on its own, I think. Hang on. Wait, can you? I'm... Can you? I don't know. We'll just have two Chris's. It's fine. We can get both perspectives. Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> okay. We can okay. Do it. Um well, now this is weird because now my microphone is what is the audio. Correct. Hmm. All right, I'm going to mute other Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Who can tell we didn't plan this? Oh, I think okay. you're right. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, it's so weird. I can hear myself on my other self. Okay, well. You got this. This is the office. Um, this is, I'm going to start with the best things. Um standing mat uh and then over here we have three screens uh we soundproof paneled the entire walls um and then got these cool soundproof panels in the back that was an instagram ad they got me pretty good Damn. um <laughs> all that good stuff back there uh two key lights we have the microphone the uh not really DSLR, but um, computer. Sorry, that's a keyboard. <laughs> and then Stream Deck, which Mason knows and loves. I love my Stream Deck. That's how I do all the sounds here. Yeah. And then over here, Mac Mini uh, M1, which I think is fantastic. And then streaming PC. Nice. My yeah. goodness. It, it looks so yeah. clean. And I, then like, I don't like it. The Ergodox. <laughs> Relegated yeah. to the... Ha yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Museum of Keyboards. Uh, all the Sammies. All the Sammies. Uh, old Surface. Yeah. Huh. I'm just in awe. Every time I see this. I... You know, it's too clean. Like mine looks. I, I have the same key light. So like when he was he was showing the key, like I got those off Chris's recommendation, and they really do help. Uh, Matt, you don't need them, um, because you, you don't <laughs> show your face. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna buy some key lights. Just you know. Yeah, make building. sure your lighting is really good. So when you yeah, you buy key lights, but you won't have a webcam. Well, no, 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 you. I don't know if you know this, but I have a full like theater lighting rig in my office. So I am like the most well lit person ever. And we never see it. Yep. Seems like a seems Chris, like a shame. You're muted. you're still muted on this side, Chris. Um. Yeah. My my desk. Like, if you're like, if I was to, like, there is junk right here. Like, you mm -hmm. can kind of see it poking up, but like, if it's out of frame, it's out of mind. 
Like, there's this, this, I don't know why, but the TCP IP book, actually, I know exactly why this has been sitting on my couch. Um, and then, like, if you look at my desk, it's like, oh, look, my Nintendo Switch, it's right here. I've been learning how to do card tricks. I've got that. Here's my D&D sheet. Um, I have napkins. There's some scissors. I have oh, it's just so much junk on my desk. Like, I've got pretzels. Yeah. I'll, so that's why I don't show people my desk. Because you don't need to, you don't need to see the the clutter that is my life. Like I don't know, I feel like Chris just like subtly flexes his setup whenever he can. It's just it's so a, clean. It is very subtle, and I don't know this how he's actually it so the clean. Dirtiest it's ever been. Oh boo, oh. boo! <laughs> I actually like, really don't like it currently because it's too clean. No, oh, it's, yeah, it's too much. Uh, like oh, do you, do you have, either of you have a standing desk? I have a manual one, but yes, I do stand quite a bit. Yeah, same. I stand a lot. <laughs> we're, we're going is, up and down. This is my first Cloud Chat uh, <laughs> sitting. Uh, oh, yeah. You've been stunning recently. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you're I shooting. Should, I can tell. Yeah. I should do that, but I'm afraid that if I do it, it's going to mess up my lighting because I have a I have really low ceiling. Well, not low ceilings, but I don't have vaulted ceilings anymore. So, like, if I put it up, you'll see my ceiling fan and then my key lights reflect off my picture frame in the back. So, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> But let's see what the people in our chat have to say in yeah. our Hello World section. So we have a new segment this this week called Hello World, which is where we're just going to go through the chat. And we're going to click on it. We're going to say hello to everybody. So. Uh, that, Ali yeah. Rezam. Rez, Rez, yeah. Oh, they, they say hello. Hello. How's Usernames it going? Usernames are very difficult. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Usernames are hard. Andy says, "What's up? How's it going? Bobby's here. If you haven't never, if you haven't seen Bobby, he's been on the show before. We need to have Bobby back soon. So, we do. um, what you got there, Chris? Going all in on the chat. Well, the uh, YouTube chat. Can yeah. I pop out the. What are you trying to pop out? Um, the full chat with all all of the all of the resource all, all the sources. What's uh, up, Matt Williamson? Uh, Donald I don't Moore, know. welcome back. I don't know if you can do that from." Are you using StreamYard? I don't know. Uh, uh, I've got, I've got, I can pop in like half of StreamYard. Aha. Well, we got it right here. We're just pulling them up. So just pull them up, Chris. It's fine. Oh, all right. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, they, it's it yeah. looks better when you when you have it like that because then actually it's bigger. Well, not the same size. I don't Whatever. know. Whatever. Anyway, ah, uh, Stephanie like Paul says my own name on screen. Yeah, <laughs> Stephanie Paul says they have a one thirty two inch four K monitor, two twenty seven inch, and one curve thirty five inch. Okay, the, those curved monitors are nice. Oh, um, this is gonna be a big, big monitor. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. That's a lot. I also so I have a problem with monitors being different sizes, and then how do I orient them? And I finally had to get over that. I have two, and then the small one. But like, if they're all different size, like it, it bugs me. Like the 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 lack of symmetry bugs me, and it yeah. Well, so it, I, I have a, it's tough. I have a graveyard now of monitors that are the different sizes. I ended up when I when I redid this setup, I end up purchasing brand new ones so they're the same size. Oh my, yeah. I think that should be next week. Let's let's talk about our tech graveyard. Um, <laughs> go through the oldest pieces of junk we have in our thing. Uh, Prabot says hello. Hello, hello. Uh, Polina's in chat. Hey, Polina. Yep, I'm going down from the top. So you going down? I'll, I'll get I'll get I'm, you there in I'm a going second. Up from the bottom. Okay, <laughs> we'll meet halfway. Uh, Kervin says workbook is a MacBook Pro with a single screen for background noise and sometimes database stuff. If I'm working with my desktop on side project, three monitors, one in vertical for reading docs research, one for IDE, one for background. Yeah, that's that's pretty much that three monitor setup is almost exactly how I do it. And I can do laptop work with one monitor when I'm traveling. Like it's when I'm traveling, it's okay. But if mm -hmm. I had to do it on a day to day basis, um, and I think it would only work because it's a Mac, because like we discussed it last, last week, like needing the different de the virtual desktops and yeah. how good the integration is with that. So uh, Prabhat says he's, I think Prabhat has a Mac. I have an adjustable desk and a foldable treadmill. I have a treadmill too. It doesn't really do much. Like, can you treadmill while still using your desk? Those do exist where you they have to power exist, your right? where you have to power your PC with with that. So, uh, pneumatic. Matt says, "What's up?" Paulina's here. Okay, that's everyone that we have in Hello World today. I see Ricardo. What's up, Ricardo? Ricardo oh, we got another me. one. We got another one. Hey, Ricardo. Oh, I don't, don't ask the question. What? Walk and work at the same time. 
So it is like a desk and treadmill combined. Yeah. Uh, That's great. I, I found these. <laughs> which no thank, no thanks. Is the is the price of a real treadmill, but can no go thanks. underneath the desk. Yeah. I've I'm seen good. those ones that are, they're like little paddles. It's kind of like yeah. a little elliptical. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I like my chair. <laughs> I like my chair. That's actually one thing that like like I've replaced this chair. I mean, we I think we talked about it before. You know, like me getting my new chair yes. on Cloud Chats and. Uh, I'm very picky about my chairs because if I'm going to be sitting in it all day, it needs to be comfortable. For sure. Uh, I did see somebody, they got a, a, a convertible sit-to-stand desk at like a thrift shop or something where it was it was gears and you had like a little pulley crank and you could see like all the gears underneath. It was kind of fun. That's they sell cool. those at Ikea. They have manual, like this, This my, my desk is literally an Ikea desk, and they have a manual one and then an electric one. And honestly, thinking about it now, I should have got the manual one, because the electric one, I ha whenever I want to use it, I have to like smack it, because it, it's not the greatest. Um, yeah. But no, yeah. But like, I, I, have a, I have a completely manual one. It's a, like a gas cylinder, and I, have, I am right at its weight limit now, I think. Like, it doesn't feel very stable when it's up anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh Great. So now let's move on to Newsflash, segment of our show where we talk about the recent news set portions, headlines, thingamabobs that have gathered our attention this week. And I think we have some good ones this week. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So we're going to talk about the news. And whenever you hear this sound, means that we're moving on to the next segment. So our first segment comes out of the world of JavaScript. There's a lot of JavaScript this way, by the way. And it's Next.js is a 10.2 release with faster everything so faster, yeah. chris chris matt y'all want to talk about it yeah i think yeah just faster everything is is honestly the summary here um this release seems to just be very focused on like improving development experience uh but also like builds in general uh it's, i don't know it's kind of basically webpack improvements um which yeah. is not surprising really when you see the last thing right at the bottom of the article uh the tobias who's the author of webpack itself has joined the Next.js team. So it, it's not at all surprising that we're getting some nice build improvements. Yeah, yeah. it really does help when you have the person who built it there. I am seeing a, a couple problems with Webpack 5. It is faster for me, but um, when using Tailwind's just-in-time compilation, it kind of doesn't work. So I had to switch back to 4 for now. Oh, yeah, it doesn't, that doesn't surprise me at all, really. Yeah. Webpack 5 is quite new. Yeah. yeah. No, I like, yeah, I played around with, we're like, we're building a new stack that's in Next. Um, yeah, and Webpack 5 is like definitely faster, definitely produces smaller bundle sizes. And it also seems to have more sane chunking as well. Mm. Like, I was, mm. I was like really getting into the weeds, like comparing chunks and stuff. And it seems to be doing a better job of figuring out what needs to be in what chunk. So. Nice. I, this also was an interesting one. Uh, automatic web font optimization. It basically just throws it right in. Interesting. So, so it just makes it... Okay. Pretty much inlines it. Okay. How does that work, though, with the way that Google Fonts now... Doesn't Google Fonts now optimize based on its requesting user agent? Yeah, I remember reading that. Um... I don't know, maybe they just get past that somehow. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll move on to our next segment. Sorry. Sorry, I was, I was reading the chat. <laughs> more, more JavaScript coming up. Announcing Rome tools. Rome is an end-to-end -end development chain. They consolidate dozens of separate tools into one, which support for JavaScript, TypeScript, HTML, and CSS. Rome can install dependencies, check your code for errors, run your tests, bundle your code, and more, all via single CLI. Rome is not a collection of tools. It has been written from scratch. Okay. Yeah. Really cool. Um, comes from Seb, Seb who's uh, ex-Babel, so very much kind of in the JavaScript ecosystem, understands low-level kind of bundling and everything. Uh, yeah, it's just a brand new tool chain that replaces like everything we've come to know as the standard kind of JavaScript tool chain. So it replaces Babel, replaces ESLint, gets rid of Webpack, uh, prettier, get rid of that as well, and Jest are their examples. They kind of do it all. Hmm. Okay. Have you messed with it, or is it out? I have not looked at it at all, to be honest with you. Um, okay. I really should, but yeah. 
I, the, yeah. the other thing that's really interesting from this article specifically, um, they've got VC funding for this. They're not going kind of the standard route of being an open source project that's open source funded. They've got proper VC funding for this. Mm. I don't know, it's just really interesting. <laughs> yeah, it'll, yeah. Um, just waiting to see how they monetize. Um, yes. I mean, cool. that is unfortunately kind of the downside to VC funding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, our next one comes out of the land of being bored in middle school. What did you love? It isn't it right though? I mean, am I right? So if you have ever had a TI 84 calculator, um, you've probably gotten bored and played some games or maybe even programmed on your calculator. Well, now Texas Instruments uh, has announced that they are doing a TI-84 Plus CE Python edition of their calculator, which will run a, if I've read correctly, it's an integrated MicroPython on your calculator. So instead of having to program your calculator in basic now, you should be able to program your calculator in Python. I don't even need a calculator and I'm excited about this. This is so cool. Um, it's just one more way of getting programming into the schools. And I, I don't know. I'm, I was so excited to see this. This is the coolest thing I've seen this week. Uh, I think next step is we got to get this, uh, basically just a SSH into a droplet. You know, I, you know, I'm waiting to do networking over, over calculator, you know, like they, can, they can do networking, right? That's like a feature. To Wait, there's like there's wi there's Wi-Fi yeah. on the calculator. No, they can you can plug them in, to talk to each other. I think. Kind of so like there must be a way uh, to then connect that to the outside Pokemon. world. Yeah. Uh, that hard. would be really interesting to figure out. But I'm whenever I get one, I will report back with it, and we will go over it because I'm definitely probably going to try now. Yeah, I don't know. The, the other interesting like, I, like this is just a question that you can't answer, but I'll throw it out there. What are the uh, OS calls going to look like? Like in Python, being able to shell out the stuff is like a really common thing. What's what's the equivalent going to be here? Can you shell out to like basic? I have no idea. I mean, it looks like from this GIF that it's just going to be like the Python REPL. So, oh, I wonder. Well, if it's running MicroPython... I'm curious how they're going to do it. I mean, if they're embedding MicroPython, I guess it depends on what the operating system is underneath on the calculator. I don't know what runs there, but but that but that but that would be it, if it shells out. Doesn't that mean that something has to be running it? So it might be Bash. Yeah, I don't know. Or they might be they I don't know, they might be writing their own runtime. That would be interesting. Who knows? I also wonder if they're going to trim. I'm I'm curious because I'm curious if they're going to like trim up the. Uh, the standard library and stuff. I'm so that's there's they, so many they, questions. I have yeah, nothing but could questions. Just stop the OS module and just not let you do that. Yeah, I have so many questions about this. But this was I saw this and I was like, this is the coolest thing I've seen in a while. I want a and actually it's really interesting because this week is PyCon, so oh, they yeah. announced they announced this with uh the Py with PyCon in mind. Um, there's always a cool announcement at PyCon. They announced when they did the VS Code remote development stuff that was announced at PyCon 2019. I was there for that. That was so cool. And the new command line terminal. That mm -hmm. was 2018. So either yeah, way. This is really cool. If you yeah. have no reason to get a new calculator, now you do. <laughs> <laughs> so you can play with Python. Um, our next story comes out of the land of funny words and logos. And jokes I, again. <laughs> is it? I, I was pretty sure that the only reason we got we put this on is because you like the logo. <laughs> I don't particularly like the logo. Yeah, I don't know. I, I thought after all this time, they should have had something a little bit more cooked up. Well, yeah, okay. it's, it's just a funny bit of news, right? It's like Spider Monkey has been around for years and years and years, and they only recently got a logo and a website. Okay. Like, that, that's I, the news. It's just they've got a logo and a website. That's, that's what I mean. I'm yep. looking at the news. It's like, has a logo. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. So if anyone doesn't know, uh, Spider Monkey <laughs> is, is Mozilla's JavaScript uh, and WebAssembly engine in the Firefox browser. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they, 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 they've got a website at last. <laughs> That's the news. Yeah. That's the news. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey from the chat says, wonder how much the TI-84 cost. I had to buy TI-83 for my daughters for $87. I, uh, It's in the 90s to low 100s, I would say. I think it's a little bit higher up than 
uh, like a TI-83, but it might even be around the same price. Wait, like I've one, seen them one, before. 120 if I remember right. It's been so long. Also, my mom was a teacher at a, at a school and she had, they she always was given like demo models and stuff to try out that they could just keep. And I just used those. Mm -hmm. I never, I've never actually bought like a graphing calculator. I love it. You go look for it. Question number one. Why is it so expensive? Well, how much does it cost? 120. Um, but, you know, back in the day when I had to shell out for it at school. That yeah. Was a lot of lunch money. Yeah. That was a lot of money, but. It's a lot today. It's really neat. Yeah. Our next, our next uh, story comes out of the land of, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it for you. <laughs> um, and <laughs> basically, Google has announced that they're turning on two-factor authentication, whether you like it or not. Um, they've, I guess that we finally come to the realization that we all knew knew that the default is what people use. And mm -hmm. if you're defaultly insecure, your product will be insecure. So Google has stated that soon it will be automatically rolling users in two-factor authenticated pr pr authentication provided their accounts are appropriately configured. Seeing as how now when you create a Gmail, like you're required to provide a telephone number, like you cannot mm -hmm. create a new Gmail account without a telephone number, they're going to probably enroll people in SMS 2FA by default. Um, uh, it looks like it's the Google prompt. The uh, if the app is open, it'll just send you a uh, like a toast notification. Does that work on Apple? Yeah. Okay. I I've always seen it on Android, and it's just like you're trying to sign in here. Okay, click. No, that that works as long as you have like any of the Google products. I think specifically Gmail installed. Okay. okay. Yeah. It sounds like they're going to be doing that, which is actually more secure than two FA or than SMS based two yeah. FA. Um. Unless you're like me and you lock yourself out of your own SMS two FA, but that's a whole nother question. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. I'm just worried about like people that don't even know what two FA is, like my mom, right? And she's gonna be like, "Well, I I gotta go find my phone to log into this thing." Yeah, but I mean, you like you don't have to explain to them what two FA is, right? You just go, it, you just say you need to have your phone. Like, don't need to go into why that's the case. Yeah, just, you need your phone to sign in now. It's more secure. It's also going to be curious how they're going to handle the situation of, oh, my phone's lost now. I don't have the 2FA anymore. Because, oh, like, yeah, it, if they're doing this automatically, they're going to probably enroll people that they've got an old phone number. Yeah, that's what they're going to have to do something with phone numbers or something. Because, like, they like if you lose your phone, like, 2FA is hard enough to explain to people as it is. But now we have to talk about recovery passphrases. Mm -hmm. um, store these magic words or you'll never see your stuff again. <laughs> Um, that's, that's not going to be fun. So I, yeah. I applaud them for doing it because I tell everyone on earth that they should be using 2FA. There's no reason not to. Um, but I do, I do believe this is going to cause some headaches and problems. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah. I also like the fact that they've just said soon. Yes. Soon. <laughs> they're, they're probably trying to figure out all the questions that we're coming up with. It's like, what happens if they lose their phone? What happens yeah. if they don't have, if they change their phone number, you know? Yeah. Who knows? We'll see. But it's it's a step in the right direction for for sure. So, definitely is definitely is. Well, that's all we have today for our news flash. But now it is time for another round of true or false. So in this round, I present my co-host with ten statements regarding any topic even remotely associated with tech, and they tell me if the statement is true or false. However, I have found that writing ones that fit a theme are a lot easier. So this, we're going to probably do themed-based ones. Turns out the cool. JavaScript one we did last week was the easiest thing I ever wrote. So this week, the theme is networking. We're doing computer oh, no. networking. Computer networking. Uh, Kahoot. And if you are... Uh, so if you want to be competitive, go to the YouTube link, okay? we yep. we There's different stream delays depending on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. So if you want to compete and you actually want to, um, like, you know, be up there and like not have to deal with stream delay, then YouTube's the place to go for that. Yeah. Um, but everyone should join and play along either way because it's really fun. Yes. Join and play along. You know, you never know what you're going to learn. We just got a fancier version of Kahoot. So it's going to be a little bit nicer this time. Um, and I'm super excited. We've got Matt in here. Make, we've got Chris, Chris, Britt, if Ricardo. I haven't figured it out yet. Go to kahoot.it and type in Hi. the code on the screen. I forgot to say that, um, but it's also on the banner. So yes, go to kahoot.it on your phone. Um, does it work on laptop? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. just... On anything, kahoot.it and enter in the code 5706810. Um, I'm going to give it, uh, 
I'm gonna give it a little bit more time. And you know, they're talking about we're talk well, actually we'll talk about the Google Authenticator stuff. Uh, you know, Chris says you Chris says you like Authy because it lets yep. you recall your codes on your new phone. That is a feature in Google Auth Authenticator now. So oh, I have okay. a mm -hmm. I have a backup phone that's in a safe deposit box that has all of my auth codes mm -hmm. that's just turned off. Like, and it sits there. Like I bought like a eighty dollar cheap phone because I, if I ever lose this phone and can't get those auths, I'm locked out of so many important things. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Google Auth, Google Authenticator basically it presents you a QR code, you scan it, and then uh, you've got your codes on another phone. That sounds actually more secure. Or, like Authy just has a cloud account. Yeah. Like you just have another email address and password. So I, I yeah, I don't feel it's very secure. Um, and also, like the way Authy does it, you can entirely defeat the point of 2FA. You can get a desktop app for Authy. You yep. can get a Chrome okay. extension for Authy. It will automatically uh, fill in your 2FA codes for you on websites. Yeah. Jeff says, many really password me. yeah. <laughs> Jeff says many password managers can also store TOTP codes. True. Yeah. There's there's a good way to do it for like that would use those too. Like I just got Google Authenticator and I like it. It's weird though, because some places require like DigitalOcean, we have to use Okta. Uh, Georgia Tech, I have to use Duo. So mm -hmm. I have like so many of them. Okay, but I think we're good. We've got 12 people. That's good. We actually can support up to like 50 now. So many the more the merrier. Uh, I'm going to give it five, four, three, slowing down for stream delay, two, <laughs> one. Stream delay is the worst. Going to pretend like there's something after one, one point. There we go. We got one more. We're good. Here we go. Kahoot, basic edition, true or false, 513, 2021 networking edition. Uh, okay. Network. Network. True or false, there are seven layers in the OSI model of computer networking. Just for clarification, no Googling if you're playing along. Yes, no Googling, you know. I think by the time they Google it, it Yes, so the way that Kahoot works is it, it rewards you for not only correct answer, but for speed. So yeah. the time that you spend having to Google it will, I mean, you you might get the correct answer, but you'll wind up on the bottom because you're mm -hmm. not going to be getting all the points. Um, yes, there are seven layers to the OSI model, physical, data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. And as I saw it on the internet the other day, it was like, it was like Ethernet card. What's this? IP. What's this? What's this? What's this? HTTP. So like nobody like <laughs> nobody actually yeah. uses like I mean, the the layers. Um, well, I'm sure if you like internet working. If you're doing yeah, the few people like the vast majority of people don't. If you're actually working in a network stack, you definitely will. Um, you'll definitely be seeing them. But like, I haven't seen this since college. So nor have I. Nope. Nor have I. Uh, Bobby, you pressed the false button before hearing the question. Bobby, I, I bet Bob, I bet you knew the answer too. So Chris Chris is on <laughs> is on top. So here we go with our next question. Bobby, DNS is a TCP history. protocol. Is DNS a TCP protocol? Yes or no? True or false? I took networking in college. I don't remember a lot of this. I took networking like two months ago. I don't remember this. <laughs> I last took networking in 2018 in grad school, but I love networking, so I know all of these. I, I actually I, I looked them up to verify my answers, but I wrote all these from, from off, off the top of my head. Nice. DCP is not TCP. DCP is, or sorry, DNS is UDP. Um, that's one of the things that makes DNS really quick is it doesn't, yeah, is that it's UDP. I can't see oh. that. There might, might be another question based on that exact answer. So what? I don't remember what my questions are. Shake up. Wow. There we go. Yeah. Next question. NAT stands for network address type. Did you pick these images? Uh, this is these come from the default. Like, remember, I like, uh, yeah. So these images I got from uh, there's like a, a library now that we have. So I just typed in network and a different network for every one, and like, and I just picked a different picture. So it made it a little bit more, you know, nice. Well, like but it. yes. Yeah, it's, it adds a little bit of flavor to it. Network stand, NAT stands for Network a uh, Address Translation. It is what allows you to have multiple devices behind a single IPv4 address. Um, NAT is not necessary for IPv6. And honestly, the invention of NAT is what's holding up IPv6 ad adoption because now we have to change how we do fundamentally how we do networking. <laughs> uh, yes, DNS can be used over TCP for security. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me say it. 
default DNS. Mm-hmm. Yes, you but can like, do we, DNS over we TCP. We could go to like DNS over HTTPS as well. Like. Yes, yes, we totally could. But like we're going to say default DNS, like no special nothing or another. Yes, DNSSEC 100% uses TCP. Okay, I yes. Um, oh, Matt, Matt's coming up. I Matt think W, like not be, even our Matt. We might be adjusting for uh, stream delay too much. I would say you only need like maybe two That's I'm going to put it down to, not because I've got the answers wrong. Okay. Yeah. I'll IPv6 has 128 bits. Is this true or false? I like that image. Like the matrix in there. There was actually a lot of good images. I was really happy with like the default library that came with um, all of this. What do we got? This is true. IPv6 is 128 bits. IPv4 was 32, and I believe IPv5 was 64, but nobody talks about IPv4. There was also an IPv3, which I believe was 48 bits. What's an IPv5? Um, something that ne- never took off. Like there's, yep. there's, I, I think there's even ones past IPv6. It's just they, they don't get adopted. Well, so there's IPv8, so. which I know of, which literally yes. just adds two more octets onto IV, IPv4, which is what we should have done, personally, I think. Yeah, well, but you know, they almost had 48 bits in IPv4 in the original days. And like, if you ever listen to some of the talks that uh, Dr. Kirk Pekusik does, who was at Berkeley when they were building the socket interface um, and like designing the internet, he's like, mm-hmm. they asked like, what would what would we do if you could go back in time? He's like, I'd add I'd add 48 bits on IPv4. What to solve this whole problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, Matt, you're coming up. You're getting it. And then Ricardo, but Ricardo's still beating you. So next question. There are over 50,000 ports on every computer's network. We'll say network interface card. Every every physical computer has over 50,000 ports. Networking ports, not physical holes. Yes, not physical holes. Like I'm not like may, maybe there are on the the cheese grater. So <laughs> Uh yes, so there are 65,535, which is that what well, that's the number of an unsigned 16 bit. So four bit, yeah, like two bit. Yeah, that's what that's where that came from. Yeah. There are 65,535 ports on every computer. Some of them are reserved. The first 2,000 are reserved, the last of which you can do for other things. Even though some companies have like their own port, like, you know, Minecraft always runs on this port or something like that. 25565. I love that you know that. Next question. DNS is the service that issues IP addresses dynamically to clients on a network. Is DNS the service that issues IP addresses dynamically to clients on a network? Whilst we wait for this, <laughs> I like what Ricardo's just said. IPv6 lets you assign an address to each of your shirt buttons. There are a lot of them. So yeah. many. We do, we do. It's amazing. Uh, no, most people got this one correct. DNS is not the service that issues IP addresses to clients. That would be DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Yes. I believe. Yeah. Sometimes I sometimes I mess up the acronyms, but I always pride myself on my acronyms. Okay, Ricardo and Jeff in the lead. Matt, Andy, but Chris is coming up. Next question. There are over one thousand two hundred and fifty top level domains. Are there more than 1250 top level do- domains? And for those of you that top level domain would be like .com, .net, .org, .ninja. Because apparently we need that. Duh. Yeah. Uh, this is true. There are currently, as of ICANN, as reported by ICANN, there are 1,498 top level domains. Because you mm-hmm. can actually go on their website and see every TLD. Now, that doesn't mean that you have access to all of them. Some of them are reserved for countries, institutions, and stuff, but there are almost 1,500 TLDs. Well, yeah, like, I think my favorite example is .google is owned by Google for Google. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of them like that. Next one. UDP protocol keeps state of packets and will attempt to redeliver lost packets. Does the UDP protocol keep state of its packets and will attempt to redeliver lost packets? Do, 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 do. I like our music for this. I even do. I can't, even really though I can't. Kind of, he- it's bringing the stress up. I can't hear it. Um, 
Yeah, this is false. UDP does not attempt to re-deliver packets. That is TCP. TCP has the keep alive. UDP is basically just, did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it? And you just throw packets mm -hmm. at, at something. This is valuable for things like streaming services, where if I lost a packet 30 seconds previously in the show, um, I don't really want to see that scene again. You know, <laughs> kind of makes no sense. Yeah. So where are we at? Oh, Matt, Bobby's coming up. Chris is knocked out of the top five. Bobby's coming up. We have two questions left. CIDR, C-I-D-R, stands for Common Interdomain Routing. This is the acronym C-I-D-R stand for Common Interdomain Routing. This one's I probably, I think, the toughest one here. I've got no idea. But yeah. I know the acronym. No idea what it stands for. Yeah. This is false. It stands for classless inner domain routing. So uh, it's, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, because you're not doing you're not doing like classes. You're doing like a you're doing a slash eight or a slash. Whereas yeah. your classes would be like class A, class B, class C, which would be which is actually essentially a slash eight, a slash sixteen, or a slash twenty four. Yes. Um, but you're when you have, when you have cider that allows us to have classlesses. And if you've ever like studied like the history of like how we messed up subnetting that, well, there's actually a lot of IP addresses left IPv4. We just messed them up by doing bad by divert by like splitting up the network in a bad way. Yeah, so much so much there to unpack. Not enough time in the day to talk about it. <laughs> Last question for all the marbles: DNS communication happens over port 43. I mean, I was really into DNS this week. Does DNS communication happen over port 43? This is false. <clears throat> so DNS happens over port 53. Who is happens over port 43? Oh, that's why I knew that number. 43? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's who is. Matt, you still manage with 7 out of 10. <laughs> Ricardo, even if you timed out, you got nine out of ten. Wow. Okay, we've got some networking experts here. And Jeff, we have Jeff here over here with nine out of ten. But yeah, so we'll, we'll I'll try to go back and forth between front end, back end, all sorts of topics. Who knows what I'm gonna do next? Um, but yes, that was another episode of True or False. That was great. I'm enjoying doing them on a theme. It yeah. One, it makes it easier to write <laughs> because well, I, I can just go it, get a book from my bookshelf. Yeah, I think it helps us as well, right? You get into the vibe of it. Like by the end of this, I feel like my my networking knowledge has slightly been resurfaced. Yeah, that is pretty valuable. And now it's time for our lightning tutorial. Every week, one of us presents a quick tutorial, hence the lightning, on a topic of our choosing. This week, Chris drew the unlucky straw, and we'll be demoing. We're doing Tailwind again. Here we go. Or did I? Are we doing yeah, Tailwind no, no. again, Chris? Yeah, we, we changed it tailwind. to Tailwind. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm, I love watching these Tailwind demos. Every time I watch them, it makes me want to actually like use Tailwind. <clears throat> Ricardo, tell me which one you got wrong. I want to know which one you got wrong because you got nine out of ten. And Jeff, you too. I want to know which ones you got wrong. This question. They got one wrong, so drop it in the drop it in the chat. But go ahead. Uh, should we do your lightning start. tutorial whilst we wait for their answers? Yes, yes, cool. we'll wait for their yeah, answers. Yeah. yeah, that was just. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm just stalling over here. Go for it. So, let me save this. So, kind of a fun demo that I like to do. Um, let's build the Slack logo in Tailwind. Mm -hmm. Where are oh, we? okay. Well, good luck. I want to watch this. So this is kind of our reference point for what we're going to build today in Tailwind. And if you don't know Tailwind, Tailwind is a CSS framework that is a little bit different than maybe like Bootstrap or something you may have been used to. It does what are called utility classes. Um, and you use a bunch of classes like background, uh, rounded corners, padding to compose your components. And uh, I know we've done a couple Tutorials on Tailwind. I just am a big fan. So uh, here we go. I think I think I'm becoming a fan through osmosis at this point. I I am too. Like 
I don't know any front end frameworks or anything about that. And this is like, this seems like it'd be the easiest one for me to pick up really quickly. Do you think that's the case, Chris? I think you really need to know CSS to use Tailwind because essentially it's just the <laughs> shorthand for the CSS mm -hmm. properties. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, um, I guess I got to go learn CSS now. But I guess you could learn Tailwind and through that learn CSS. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, yeah, I guess it's just you're learning a different syntax to do the same thing. Yeah. Um, so let's go for background. Pink is still a color. I don't know anymore. Um, and then this is how I start all of my demos is flex item center justify center. So basically what that's doing is saying uh, I am in the middle of the screen. Mm -hmm. So this is how we're starting. And basically, let's build the Slack logo. And we're going to do it with CSS Grid. Uh, the cool thing about this is that it is teaching CSS Grid through like an easier syntax also. So if you haven't messed with CSS Grid, this is kind of a good intro to it. Um, so we'll start off with a div. We're going to go for background white. Let's go for rounded full, which is a full circle. Um, that should be okay right there. I don't think it'll actually show because there's no content in it. So we could just do like height is 648. Width is 48. We get like a nice little circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and the cool thing about Tailwind is that you don't even need these like CSS or JavaScript sections. Like Tailwind, you can pretty much build everything without writing any custom CSS. What is... set are you using to make this? Oh, just code pen? Yeah. Make that a little bigger. Um, so basically, we are going to have a messed up by their comments but create a grid and then inside of that we're going to have the blues what are the what are our colors blues greens reds and oranges yellow Is that orange yellow <laughs> uh I'll go to blues, look at branding. greens reds yellows okay um so each of these is going to have two divs inside of those And then let's just go ahead and say like class is rounded full and let's go for background red. Um, and then I think they won't show because there is no content. So I'm going to actually do this for all of these two, three, and four. Okay. So we have all of those, um, but they won't show because there's no content. So the div is like zero height by zero width. So, Let's go and do a grid on the parent. And close that grid at the outside of that. And to work with CSS grid, you have to define your grid. So you have to say like, oh, I want four columns and three rows or, or three columns and three rows. So the way that Tailwind does this is it says, uh, gosh, I forget my syntax now. It is um, grid columns four. We're also going to define our rows, so that'll be grid columns, rows, four. Mm -hmm. All right, and then I just um, love Tailwind's magic. Yeah, it's it's kind of ridiculous actually. So something's wrong here. Let's go inspect. Something's not taking like a width or a height. So let's go look here. Let's look at our grid. Is right there. So you can kind of see the grid has no height to it. Is the problem? So I'm going to go and give the grid a height of full and a width of full, just so it takes up like that whole white area. There we go. Um, so now we have that kind of working. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go ahead and say flexbox item center justify center, so we can center center all those in the white circle. Um, didn't work. Cool. That's not gonna. Okay. You've got a grid, but the, the grid, the grid's full height. So you're, you're right. Centering something that's full height. You're right. Um, hmm. Now they don't take. So I'm gonna leave that off for now. <laughs> we'll figure out that later. I can't use centering um, grid. It's uh. 
out of here. Um, it's like item center or something. All right, well, hold on for a second, and then we'll figure that out. So let's just do blues here. Let's go for greens. Let's go for um, reds, which is there, and then yellow. And then um, let's go and give a gap of two. So basically, grid is really cool because you can specify spaces in between all of your grid items. Um, and if you were doing like Flexbox or something, you'd like do margin rights and stuff like that, which would kind of be annoying. So you can kind of do that in grid. And then the cool thing about grid is you can say, I can tell each specific child element, hey, you are going to sit in this spot and you're going to be this big. So for this one, I want um, kind of a blank white spot right here. So go here and say column is starting at two for this first one. Now it pushes that over and now there's like this gap and then everything else gets pushed over a little bit. So this one, we're going to say row start is two and we're going to say row span is two. So I'm going to span two, or sorry, that should be column span, huh? So there's that, and we start to see it taking shape. Um, so this one will be column row span of two. So we'll go down here, row span of two. This will be row start of two. And column start at four. And pushes it over. There we go. And then we just go down the list and kind of push everything to where they need to be. So that'll be, uh, what is that? Row one, column three, which is already there. So that's fine. And then this one row will be three, column one. one. Row start three. Row span two. Yes. <laughs> and then, and yeah, what you said, Matt, row start one, three, three, column start one. There we go. There we go. Uh, and then we we'll do the same for the yellows. So that one will be column span two. That's yeah. the right one. And then column start of three. Kind of interesting. I, I miss Mason's music now. I can put some on. You want? You want? Do you want? Do you want the the what it's, the what's on your so mind music? Like? Um, let's go for padding of ten. Yeah, that's not bad. Um, pretty close. Are you going to be able to get that little taper on the? Yes. On the okay. Yeah. So check this out. Uh, I'm going to lower the padding. Actually, ten should be good. So we, we basically created padding on the outside to push everything into the middle. Um, and now the last thing to do is there's like these little pointy things on the edges of these. So basically we're going to say border radius for that corner, zero. So if we go over here, I think that would be this one right here. We're going to say rounded bottom right, none. Cool. Uh, and then the green one should be bottom left, none. Um, so it'll be right here, rounded, bottom left, none. Okay, this will be what, top right and top left. Okay, so this is um, rounded, top right, none, and rounded, top left, none, right? And that's the Slack logo. And that's a Slack logo. So you got some CSS grid in there, and you've got uh, just some good old Tailwind classes. And I'll paste the link to this code pen in the chat. Nice. Yeah, what do you all think? Yeah, more Tailwind. I know I'm being annoying with all these Tailwind tutorials, but... No, that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I Like, I don't know. It's so simple, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I, like, but you, you do need to know your CSS. Yeah. I see. You have to understand the concept of a grid and the concept of flex and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's, there's yeah. a tiny bit of me that gets really annoyed at having so many classes. 
Yeah. Uh, if you if you're using like React or something, then you can like extrapolate a lot of this into components. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, it's either so it's either this inline, which you know you could call inline styles, which some people do, um, or you could give it a class and be like uh, blue first. Blue second, and then you have like this context switch to go find your yeah um, CSS. So I don't know trade offs. How do you, how I kinda... do you tell when within like CSS? Do they have like SAS mixins or something? Uh, that's exactly right. Yeah. So if I had like blue first, you would have apply is the SAS mixin, and then you just like kind of take this. It's actually not even SAS. It's um pro CSS. Uh, okay. Yeah. So then that would work. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a lightning tutorial for Cloud Chats 13. Very nice. As always, lots of fun. So now we'll move on to our final segment of the day, which is the one where we have to script it because we can't tell people what's on their mind without thinking about it first. So here we go with our lovely little, you know, elevator music. What's on your mind? Uh, we'll start out to, to not make Matt feel so picked on. We'll start with Chris today because Matt always we always pick on Matt. So, <laughs> so just for today, we'll go with Chris first. So, Chris, what's on your mind? Uh, on my mind is I've been messing around with TypeScript lately, and I think this is probably like the thirtieth time I've messed with TypeScript, <laughs> but. Every time I'm like, ah, this is too much work. I'll go back to JavaScript or blah, 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 blah. So this time I think it's actually kind of sticking and I like it. But I'm wondering like other people probably, you know, Matt has gone through this journey longer than I have of liking TypeScript and not liking it. So uh, no, you see, like I saw your tweet. <laughs> Uh, and, and the timeline that you portrayed in it, and it, it's far more dedicated to TypeScript than I've ever been. Like, <laughs> I looked at TypeScript once, did a couple of projects in it, and went, you know what, I'm just too lazy for this, and I just write JS doc when I need it. Yeah, yeah, you're you're. Uh, that's a good point. I think JS doc gets you a lot of the way. I think where TypeScript kind of helps is you can like type hint the responses from like fetch calls and stuff like that. But yeah, then it gets really, really messy i saw a tweet it was like uh there's two ways to write typescript uh and that's one is wow this is really cool and two is what in the world is that code yes i say like i've looked at some typescript projects and it's gone where's where, where's the actual javascript business logic here <laughs> it's all just typings <laughs> all for one fetch call <laughs> yeah which is like i don't know kind of why i like js doc because you can choose where you want to use it and where you don't like yeah sometimes i just go yeah, this, this returns an object. You figure out what's inside it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I'm at. I currently liking it, and I know this is like a JavaScripty sort of uh, episode, Clivern. Yeah, we, we our true or false was network like network east. That was infra based. There is there is usually infrastructure. I mean, there's infrastructure chat. It's all sorts of chat. It's whatever it happens to be. Honestly, it was what was on top of the news this week, and there wasn't a lot yeah. of interest stuff this week. Unfortunately, I maybe I can uh, maybe we can talk about some uh, CDNJS stuff next week because we're restructuring a lot of our infra. That'd be pretty cool. You can do anything. Is there anything you can do with that with the lightning tutorial? I don't know. I'll have to find out. I'll, to, I'll have to talk to the people that are actually doing the restructuring because <laughs> mm. I'm not. I'm just spectating. <laughs> okay. Uh... I, I guess we'll go ahead with yeah go ahead matt you're, you're next sure. uh yeah like both the things on mine are actually like hack and use things like honestly the only source i use i i look at this nowadays um people might be familiar with can i use.com uh, if you're in the web development space i'm sure you've gone to it before uh it's a great little site for like checking what features each browser supports uh someone has made a spin-off of it called can i email it's just brilliant. It's it's the same thing, but for emails. Because if you've ever worked with email, you will know how disastrous the CSS support is for emails. Um, so I'm. This is. I've like. I don't plan to ever go near email ever again in my life. 
but the fact that this tool now exists makes it far more kind of palatable. Uh, wow. Would you ever write your own email HTML? I have in the past. I feel like, like since I did that five years ago, mm. the tooling has come a long way. Like, I don't think you would. Um, saying that, like, DigitalOcean Community, for example, we have our own email templates that we maintain. It's easier. Mm. But yeah, I don't know. But like, uh, it, you can play around with this site if you want to on their own. Um, it's shocking how bad the support is in email, essentially. Like, there's uh, a lot of things about Gmail. email that is shocking. Uh, I'm surprised by the Gmail support. Like, okay, let's see what else. Like, we got. email uh, is still in the land of you use table for layouts. They have support for clamp, but not justify content. Let's see. Yeah, that's tough. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, the way I've always looked at email is you use tables, you inline all your styles, mm -hmm. and you kind of pretend that you're targeting a Netscape browser. That sounds so much fun. <laughs> yeah, Do you have, does it still support Marquee? Uh, Chris, Marquee, is it there? Uh, is it M A R Q? Yeah, just M I R Q. Uh, yes, Marquee <laughs> element. What supports it? Yes. Oh, like everything. Uh, from, oh, it's pretty good. I, I, I love it. I love that we still support these. <laughs> Terrible. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Don Donald's right. That's what I was thinking. It has clamp, but not just simple flexbox stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, table is where it's at. Who would have known that email was bad? Raise your hand. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, only, bring the back Google thing. Wave. <laughs> God, there's, there's so many support. How yeah. how would you do after when you're like inlining styles? I guess like Apple Mail must have support for actual style tags. Wait, are style tags not supported? Uh, historically, no. Oh my gosh! Like you inline your styles properly? Yeah. Okay, come up for air. I feel like I feel like we're diving deeper <laughs> and deeper into. Does it support this? Oh, okay, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's, yeah, go play with the side if you want. Yeah, if, I'm, if, I'm just gonna just keep die inside. <laughs> if you want to be baffled by email, go there. Yeah, Flexbox support there. Hold on, one more grid. Okay, expected. Display none. Okay. Oh, you can't like hide stuff on mobile Gmail. Cool. <laughs> uh, Okay. Anyway, right, yeah. The only yeah, other yeah. things on my mind. Uh, this week, Babel released a blog post talking about like open source funding, specifically for their project. But it raises a really like it brings up the conversation again about how broken open source funding is. Um, Babel is like the core for a lot of JavaScript tooling. You've probably never actually encountered it because it's so low level in all of our tooling. Um, which part of the reason it has really bad funding is because no one thinks about it uh, but they have one maintainer they pay full-time and a couple of others they're trying to pay they're, they currently pay part-time trying to pay full-time turns out they just don't have the money to do it oh um, it's one it's one b i thought this was that language learning app no like i thought i thought this was like the oh i want to learn how to speak spanish the app need like i put like I, okay that this makes a whole this makes a whole lot more sense because I'm like, why are they doing crowdfunding? They're they're a they're a for profit company. But okay, continue. Sorry, I I <laughs> no no, this is Babel JS. Uh, okay, well now we learn something new every day, Matt. Uh, I see I see Chris bring it up. There you go. Yeah, so we got. I swear it was Babel. Um, okay, so we've got. I don't know. Like some people put Babel, some people put Babel. Yeah, I don't know. Right. I, I don't know. Um, and then here is what Mason is talking about, which is two B's, two B's, three B's. technically three B's because that begins. Sold. With... <laughs> yes, I know. That's why, like, I, I saw the news. <laughs> I, I didn't click on it because I did like, okay, so I was a bad internet citizen. I didn't read the article, but I just assumed that because I knew it, like the, okay, difference between one B and two B is apparently a couple million dollars. Um, yeah. 
anyway, yeah, so. yeah, Babel, like, yeah, they're, they're struggling with funding. Um, I don't know. It, it's just, it's been on my mind that open source funding is broken and it's just come up in conversation again. Yeah. I don't know what the solution is. I feel like no one knows what the real solution is, really. It's like, you want, you want big corporations to pay to rely on this stuff, but then you're not really open source if you start mandating that. Yeah, but I mean, there, I mean, there are other open source projects that have solved this problem. So mm -hmm. maybe they just, maybe they just need to get in contact with some of them. Maybe they need like, you know, the PSF functions very relatively well at keeping Python running. Yes. Um, that's, that's like, the other thing, right? Is Babel's completely independent. So they're yeah, not see, part of like OpenJSF or anything. Yeah, uh, it feels like they need to, you know, there are people that have solved this problem and may are, you know, not going to say it's solved, but there are people that have, that are living in this same problem and if they you know hopefully they'll connect and figure it out yeah but yeah, i don't know it's been on my mind yeah open source funding is a messy place it is uh, what's on your mind mason uh, thank you for asking matt i always wait um <laughs> i got my last vaccine on monday and that is exciting i had relatively no effects other than the fact that now it like it seems like every time I get it, I don't have the vaccine effects, but I it makes my allergies a lot more sensitive. So now I have allergy problems. Um, so I'm having to take like my allergy meds. That doesn't but surprise me really, right? It's like it triggers same, an immune yeah. Thing. yeah. It triggers an immune response, and my immune system's busy dealing with when it's normally pretty busy dealing with my allergies. Now it's dealing with the vaccine stuff, so it just lets the allergies through the front gates. And I'm like, you know, please. Mm -hmm. I need my brain today, and allergies are do a really good job of giving me brain fog. Um, Don't be picky. You said last. Moderna. No, 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 no. You said last vaccine. Well, I got the Not second be the vaccine. Last. Well, yeah, I got the second to vaccine. <laughs> yeah. To be last, determined. Yeah, it's last still the initial dose. We will. Yes, we will see. Yeah. The world. The world's a weird place, but that's. That's been good. I'm looking forward to being, you know, fully vaccinated, hopefully getting to travel, maybe, maybe doing some in-person conferences this year. There's, there's, there's whispers in the force. So who knows what will end up happening with that. And then, oh, I went down a rabbit hole yesterday with the Windows subsystem for Linux. Um, oh. Yeah. And wow, like I'm doing a tutorial on how to, how to use it. And to do WSL2, you have to... So, I, one... Okay, I installed WSL. I assume mm -hmm. that that means I want the latest version. No, no, no. You have to download an MSI, like which is essentially the Linux kernel, and then and then it patches the system. And I was like, what is... It just... I, I got I got halfway through writing a tutorial and hit, a, and hit such a hard roadblock that I had... I looked... I'm looking back at it now going, I need to... Ch I, I need to change everything about this. So... My pro problem is, is that, like, why is this so tough? This should not be this hard. Like, it shouldn't be, like, because I installed, I got WSL running, I installed, installed Docker, I got all the way through all of that, and then I get to Docker, and it's like, you're running in WSL 1. I was like, no, I said 2. Well, it's because I didn't patch the kernel. And now I have to set some defaults. And I'm like, just set WSL 2 as the default by default. <laughs> it's, it's, it's better. Like... It's the new version. It's like it's like me getting a Windows ISO and it installs Windows ninety five by default. Like no, like we don't need it. Like, <laughs> it's so irritating. Yeah. But but the fun thing is, is I did. Like I I have to do all these. I'm doing screenshots and stuff for the tutorial, and I'm I have to do it all in the VM because I can't do it on my machine. So I'm running Hyper V inside of Hyper V. Which is oh, caused right, yeah, some WSL is Hyper V, right? <laughs> yes. So, which has caused some interesting issues. Um, I've gotten like three or four blue screens of death. Um, and I'm like, and I'm I'm hoping that I, I I'm like, well, I hope this isn't actually part of the WSL. I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure that Type Two hypervisors were not intended to run with other Type Two hypervisors inside them. Um, we're kind of playing, you know, we're doing things we shouldn't be doing. We're bringing back dinosaurs, you know, at, at, in a park with apparently no backup power system. So but you got it working though. So I did, I did, but it was definitely it's uh, it just it stinks when you have to throw out a whole day's worth of work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, mean, I guess it isn't. I learned a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. was a learning experience. Yep. Yeah, but still, I was like, my goal was to get that tutorial done yesterday, and I I wound up I wound up in like the deep the deep depths of GitHub issues, going, why is it doing this? 
<laughs> so that's um, the kind of a day I enjoy, you know, just diving through GitHub issues. You know, if I if I make it to GitHub issues, I have like, well, I have issues, obviously, but like, it means a your project's not stable, or b you're not documented well enough. Mm -hmm. Like, I shouldn't be needing to scour issues to find out how to use the product, especially yes. when I'm not I'm not doing anything advanced. I'm setting it up. Yeah, I was like, I end up in GitHub issues when I'm doing low-level hacky stuff to a project. Yes, not if I setting it up. Yes, and if I wind up in there, then I'm like, okay, this like there's appropriate times. Yeah, setup is not one of them. So, yeah, well, that, I think you can uh, chat with uh, Bobby in in chat. Yeah. Oh, I got it working. I have WSL for Docker running on my local desktop. It was just, can I do this in a reproducible set of instructions so that way I can write a tutorial about it. Yeah. And the answer is I did it wrong yesterday and I have to do it again. So I have to do a whole reinstall of Windows or re-update. Like that's the hard thing is like I didn't take a snapshot of my Windows VM because uh -huh. Mason's not. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have to do a full reinstall. Have fun with uh, that. Yeah. I, well, I tried making that tutorial for WSL one back in the day and same same scenario of I have it. All it's the on screenshots and then oh. it's my first one. Like my first blog on my personal website. Well, not the first one, but my first tutorial, I, I wrote it the day before I started at DigitalOcean. I was in the airport at, in Austin finishing it and published it like the day before I started here. And wow. now I'm kind of over here going, okay, let's let's do a new one. Like, let's do, a, yeah. like, let's up, let's update it because it's been, it's been a, almost two years. So, and that one was on WSL1. So, but yeah, that's what's been on my mind. I look forward to reading it once it's, it's finished. It's a fun one, honestly, and like I'm gonna do a tech talk over it. That's kind of why I'm doing with the tutorial, so that way, I, whenever I'm done with the tech talk, I can just link people to the tutorial so they can do it. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that'll be coming up in June, I think. That's not my next tech talk. I think it's my next next tech talk. I think my next tech talk is deploying Python. Speaking of tech talks that are coming up, Chris has one next week using Prisma with PostgreSQL. So Chris, what are you gonna be doing with that? Yeah, so Prisma is a tool that, uh, what do they build themselves at? It's kind of like an ORM. Um, yeah, I think ORM is kind of the thing that people go to for describing it. It's yeah. not a CMS? No, no, no. Next generation, Node.js, and TypeScript ORM. So this is really cool in the Jamstack serverless sort of scenario where, um, like for me, if I want to build an API, talk to a database, I usually lean to Laravel. Um, and I've done a lot of those tech talks, but if you're building a node and maybe you're, you have a Next.js app where you have serverless functions to connect to your database and like go grab data predictably, uh, with relations and like Prisma is that tool that like helps you say, I need like a user and all of the users blog posts and all of these things. And, um, so we're going to be building a CRUD app using node and Prisma, and we'll see how it goes. But uh, I did have to dig through a couple of GitHub issues this, this week. Uh, so it'll be fun. Cool. Yeah. 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 Good. We're looking, fo looking forward to it. And then we have an announcement that, you know, Cliveron was asking about, are we going to be doing any infrastructure chat? We do, we do some on occasion. But now, like as you've seen, it's been two front end devs and you know a back end or full hey, stack I'm, and back end. Full stack. I'm I know you're full. Yeah. I know you're full. Yes, and I and you did. You saw, you saw how sensitive we are about that. Yeah, I can tell you're sensitive about it. But I also heard your tears hitting the pavement when I said that today's uh, true or false was over networking. Very true. Um, Not that full stack. Okay, that's the level of full stack like or back end that I am. Stack. Okay, fine. And I'm a ground stack engineer, Chris. Okay. Like <laughs> either way, like I don't, I don't do, I I can do the bare minimum with CSS if you give me enough Google, mm -hmm. um, but I cannot write CSS off the top of my head. Well, we're getting another person like me. Um, we hired a new developer advocate and they will be joining the show on May 27th. They are uh, focused specifically on Kubernetes and cloud native. So we're going to start seeing you know, hopefully when they do like lightning tutorials and stuff, we'll start seeing some more like it'll kind of go back and forth because we've kind of been doing lightning tutorials where we kind of rotate. I think Matt's up next week. Yep. Um, so you're going to see you're going to start seeing more 
you know, infrastructure based things in it as well. So, and like, I think the infrastructure is code. I'll do a Terraform demo my next time. So yeah, if I haven't, al if I haven't already, I've done, we've done so many of these. I don't remember what I've done. I don't think we've done Terraform. I'm going to do some Git stuff next week. I think. Did I do Terraform already? I don't no. think so. No? How could no. I don't even remember. It's been so, well, Chris did most of our lightning tutorials at the very beginning. Yeah. Cause he always has something that he can demo. But all three of us, Chris just uh, yeah. is always doing stuff. No, I think we all are. I just, you know, have recently made a video on it or a tech talk on it. Mm. So, well, that, yeah. yeah, that's that's. I mean, that's why I did the, the Django REST framework one last week. So I don't know. I'm lo I'm looking forward to learning some more Kubernetes stuff at last. That will be pretty fun. I'm looking forward to our new person. So they will be joining on 527 um, for cloud chats, and we will look forward to having them. So our next thing on the list, as always, is my joke of the day. I love this one, which means you're going to hate it, Matt. Great. Go okay. So are we ready? I'm what ready. Do you, what do you call a ride-sharing app that serves breakfast? Something I want. <laughs> Eggs Uber Easy. Okay. All right. <laughs> I love it. It's mm -hmm. so bad and it's so good. <laughs> Matt's not talking to me anymore, everyone. So with that, we're going to close out the day <laughs> because I feel like I have just broken Matt. Oh, so, so bad. <laughs> uh, well, that's all we have for today, everyone. Thank you for joining Cloud Chats. We'll be back at the same time next week for another episode. See y'all later. See you then. See you, everybody.